Do you struggle with insecurity, inadequacy, feelings like you aren't enough, that you don't have what it takes? I think if we're honest, every single one of us has moments in our life where we come up against situations, we encounter people and we feel a little bit insecure. We feel like we don't have what it takes or we're less than. And that's why we're gonna be diving into a brand new series, a five week series, and this week, we're gonna be talking about that feeling of insecurity and inadequacy. And there's so many things in the world that they present on TV and commercials and people say, this'll make you happy, this'll make you fulfilled, this'll make you feel adequate. There's some self-help things that you're gonna, if I could just do this and pull myself up with the bootstraps, but a lot of times when we've tried and done those things, we kind of walk back and we go, it was helpful, but I still feel unfulfilled. Now the Bible says that God came to give life and give it abundantly. So as we jump into this series of life hacks, what if we see what God's word has to say about how we should live our lives? Probably a great place to go to the source, right? If he made us, he should know. So let's jump into some worship. With that in mind, welcome to church. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. And come.
Hey everybody, it's great to be home, great to be back after a month of being gone with my family and traveling and enjoying some time together. We have such an amazing teaching team with such diversity of backgrounds, preachers and teachers and storytellers. We're just so blessed as a church family. But it is exciting to start a new series with you today. I want to welcome you from around the world, around the country, and around the state of Arizona. Thank you for spending some time growing with us today. Actually, um, we took our 19-month-old brand new baby girl with us this year on vacation. And uh, I came back to serve at church because I needed to rest. That's exactly what needs to happen. I have a whole new level of respect for my wife, Nicole. I don't know how she does it in her early 50s anymore um, because I looked at her and said, baby, you're a saint and I'm gonna come visit you in heaven. It's your mansion that you're gonna have. It's a lot bigger than mine, but we had a great time as a family, but it's good to be back with you today starting a brand new series, Life Hacks. Here we go. So let me start this way. There are so many ways in this world that we identify ourselves. What's our identity? People say, well, I'm a Republican, or I'm a Democrat, or I'm a business leader, I'm a Cardinals fan. Not sure why you would say you're a Cardinals fan. We'll just go with that, all right. I'm a truck guy, or you see those license plate, princess, I'm a princess, okay, whatever, don't date that one. Okay, just keep moving, all right. I'm a Swifty, that's from my daughter Abigail, for Taylor Swift, all right. I'm a mom, I'm a dad, I'm a grandparent, I'm Italian, I'm Irish, I'm an American, I'm, pa I'm a patriot. There's so many ways we identify ourselves. If you're a churchgoer, Jesus follower watching with us today, you say, I'm a child of God, I'm a Christian, I'm a Jesus follower. But Paul, in his letters in the New Testament, has an identity for us as Jesus followers that we often don't think about. Listen to what Paul writes to his friends in Philippi. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul says this, above all, very important statement, above all, you must live, walk, act as citizens of heaven. Say that with me, citizens of heaven. He goes on later in this letter and he says this in chapter 3, verse 20. He says, but we are citizens of heaven. And for the next five weeks, I'm going to talk to us about living as citizens of heaven. I'm going to start with something today that's really personal. Um, before I went on break um, this summer, I spent some time with a good friend of mine and talking about some stuff that I was wrestling with. He's gone from being a pastor to becoming a life coach. He's going into the counseling field. They're just uh, mental health issues are such a pandemic for us these days. And he just really felt like God was calling him to make a difference. And so I wanna to talk to you today a little bit about something we all deal with and I've wrestled with in my life, insecurity. And so this friend of mine who became a life coach said, hey, <clears throat> in my training, I need to log a whole bunch of hours uh, before I can get my certificate, before I can get my license. And he said, can I meet with you? Can we maybe do it on Zoom if that's better for your schedule? And he says, here's the deal. I won't charge you anything and uh, it'll be free for you. I just need to log some hours. I'm like, you know what? I really could use this. And being a frugal German, it fit my budget. Free is beautiful, okay? So I said, let's do this. Well, my friend is really good at asking questions. And as he asked questions and did a lot of listening and I started just emoting and processing about life, he uncovered some things in my soul that were rolling around that I felt late at night, but sometimes struggled to express. He uncovered some imposter syndrome. Uh, my education doesn't have the accreditation that some of my friends do in ministry. My master's in theology doesn't carry the weight academically that some of my friends in ministry. Sometimes I, I wonder, am I, am I smart enough? Am, am, uh, does my education carry the weight that it needs to to lead a church this size? I'm just gonna be extra real with you, okay? And some, maybe some in, uh, insecurities in my ability to finish strong as I head into this next season of my life. I'm now in my uh, early 50s. Okay, I'm 54 now. Um, will I finish strong? We're looking at future expansion and things that we're gonna do and just like, man, do I have what it takes? And then he kind of unearthed in my soul this fear of failure. And then in the face of all this, I realized, man, I think all of us deal with two main insecurities. First insecurity is this, if they really knew me, would they love me? Would they, would they still wanna be my friend? Would they still be connected to me? Would they still respect me? Would they still honor me? And then the second one is this, and we all wrestle with this, do I have what it takes? Am I enough? And then my friend kinda of said, I'm gonna take off my counselor hat and just talk to you as a friend for a second. He kinda of leaned in on the camera on the Zoom call and he said, Dan, you're so successful in the world standards of large church, large ministry, and there's so many leaders that I know that look up to you and they go to you for advice. And every time I talk to a pastor in the greater Phoenix area, they 
a lot of times your name comes up and they talk about you and you know, at first I thought, man, this is very encouraging, and he's trying to strengthen my inner, inner man, going, you're, you're all right, dude, you got what it takes. And then I realized he was setting me up for something. He says, look at all that you do. Look at not just at Pure Heart, but around the city with school, large school ministry that's now national, and all these things that are happening with mental health issues and addiction issues that Pure Heart's a part of, and food scarcity, and now working with Safe Lots to help single moms with raising kids in their cars in our city. All these amazing things, preschools, restaurant on your campus, all this stuff. And he leaned in and he said, I have a question for you. How'd you get where you are? <laughs> And as soon as he asked that question, I knew exactly what he was saying. Hey, Dan, all this insecurity, all this fear of failure, all, you think you got here on your own? You think you did this on your own? And then, and then he goes, um, I have a few verses in the New Testament I want you to memorize and reflect on over the next week. And then next week when we get back together to talk about your insecurities, I want you to share with me what the Lord said to you through these verses. And so he took me to three verses that God put in the Bible two months ago. <laughs> okay, no, I didn't. But I, I had never caught this before. I had never seen this before. I know many of you out there watching, you have, and it's because you probably have a stronger education than I do, more accredited. Okay, here we go with that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. And the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to his friends in Corinth, and he's been kind of defending himself a little bit, and he's dealing with some of the things that have been said about him. And then Paul says these words, and I'm telling you, they were like a glass of water on a 117 degree day. He said this, we are confident of all this because of our great trust in God through Christ. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. And watch this, he has enabled us to be his ministers. <laughs> and I read that and it was like, Oh my goodness, this is going to be a great journey. So I want to take you through and break this down for you one verse at a time, one verse at a time. I want to walk you through what the Lord's been saying to me. And I believe as we start this series, it's going to lay a foundation for the rest of the series. So let's break this down. And I'm going to show you some things that I've discovered as a citizen of heaven, some life hacks to cut through the insecurities this life often throws our way. Let's do this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, let's start again with verse Four, we are confident, we are strong in our belief of all this. And then he says, because, here's why, here's why, because of our great trust, not in our great ability, but our great trust in God through Christ. See, trust is foundational, is the foundation of all relationships. There is no foundation, there is no relationship without trust. And my great trust in God is because God is great. <laughs> so you're thinking, didn't I pray a prayer like that when I was a little kid? God is great. God is good. Let me thank you for the food. Well, I, something like that, right? But let me say it this way. We are raising this beautiful little girl. And I know every time I teach, I show pictures of her and today will be no different. All right. And so you have to understand with Olivia, she's 19 months old. The gap, get this, the gap between my knowledge as a 54 year old and my experience and my understanding and Olivia at age 19 months, the gap is huge between Olivia and I. My knowledge is vastly greater than hers. But think about this. The gap between my mind and my understanding pales. You can't even measure it into, into, into significance to Father God's vastly greater knowledge, wisdom, understanding of everything. My trust is in, my great trust is in my great God who is vastly smarter and greater than I am. As a father, I see what Olivia doesn't see. I know what she doesn't no, when we were in Oceanside on our break this year, um, she's now walking. She went from crawling to running overnight. I don't know how it happened, okay? But I, I make her hold my hand and it's quite exciting because she likes to melt down. She doesn't want to hold my hand. She wants to do what she wants to do. And she shakes her head no and she tries to pull her hand away from me and I've taught her how to hold on to my finger and it's just, it's a blast. Especially when people are walking by looking at me like, why is that old man trying to raise a child, okay? so. I finally got her to understand, you're not going anywhere unless you hold my hand. And there's a reason for that. This is the pictures that you're seeing right now, you can see. There's a reason why I want her to hold my 
hand because I know how to navigate the roads of life better than she does. I see what Olivia doesn't see. I see the danger. I see the cars. I see the large wolf wolf dogs that are coming along. I see all the things that can go wrong that she can't see. So I have put my hand in the hand of my great father in heaven and said, I need you to guide my life. I need you to direct me. My trust is in you because you, God, know, know what I don't know. Vastly more than I could even begin to understand. When we gather together as a family, especially on our once a year annual trip that we take, it's one of my favorite times, probably my favorite time, is when we gather together for family devotions and prayer time. Uh, every morning we get together and we pray together. Um, I kind of take us on a devotional journey together and we just have time talking as a family about our relationship with God and what He means to us. It is the best time we have all year long as a family. And this year, uh, you'll see a couple pictures. Um, my wife had the great idea. She said, you know, I see some things that Sydney's going through right now. I see some things, that's my, my son Luke's girlfriend, and I see things that Abby's going through, and um, our daughter Abby, and she's just like, I think we need to pray for them. So we went around and we said, hey, does anybody need anything to pray about? And I said, well, mom really feels like we need to be praying for you, Sid, the stuff you're going through. She's dealing with some physical things, and Abby, some of the emotional things you've been wrestling through. And so we put a chair in the middle of our condo that we were in and we just laid hands on our, our beautiful girls and we prayed for them. Um, and it was powerful. And what we were simply saying is this, God, we don't know how to help these kids that we love so much deal out all the things that they're going through in this crazy world, but we put them in your hands and our trust is in you that you're going to meet their needs, you're going to strengthen their lives, you're going to bring healing that only you can bring. Our great trust is in our great God, that's how Paul starts this whole section of Scripture. And Paul is saying that my confidence is rooted in my great trust in God. And this is what he says, because of Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. And I'll say it this way. This is what Paul is trying to say to us. He's saying literally because of the great price that Jesus paid for me. See, the more we begin to understand the love of God for us through Jesus, the more we trust Him. The more, think about in the natural in your relationships, the more you know someone loves you, the more you trust them, the more you go to them, the more you open up to them, the more you bring your insecurities to them. You see, the cross proves that we matter to God, that we are absolutely loved, and that no one has loved us more than God did through Jesus, His Son. So here is what we must do. We must, when we're struggling with insecurity, when we're struggling with, with things that we're going through, we must look up because He was willing to come down. Simple as that. We need to look up to Him for strength because He was willing to come down and express and demonstrate and show His great love for us. My trust is in Him because no one's loved me like Jesus has loved me. You see, there's nothing more important for me as a father to pass on to our children than the fact that I love them. Nothing matters more to me. When it's all said and done, the thing that our kids, that I want our kids to know more than anything else, that day when they're all standing around after the, the celebration of life for my life, they're all standing around and everybody's left the, the, the room and everybody shared their stories and blah, 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 and they celebrated what Jesus had done through my life and my lifetime. There's gonna come a moment when my wife is gonna be there with our children and they're gonna go around and the thing that I wanna hear, if I could listen in on that conversation more than anything else is, Dad loved me. My husband loved me. That's what I want them to know. And I also want to know them to know this. I take time to do these devotions with our kids every year on our, our trip because I want to point them to the one who loves them even more than I do. Why? Because I want them to know and to trust Him. So I want them to understand how much God loves them. You see, I love our annual trip. And when we do these intentional moments of studying together, it's important because I want my family to know the love of God. I, I take time on our trip because life slows down a little bit to intentionally tell each one of our kids how much I love them. I don't schedule it. I ask the Holy Spirit to give me a moment over that week for me to express to them in a very powerful, emotionally laden way that I love them. And I love it because I catch them by surprise. I catch them in these moments when something has happened. It's just the two of us and we're sitting there and we're talking and I can look at them and I can pour into them and I tell them intentionally how much I love them. But also, as I've been saying all along, I want to intentionally remind them that Jesus is in love with them. Now, that's the first verse. It 
So I know, this whole section's loaded, man. We'll go now to the next verse, verse 5. Back to Paul's insight. He says this, It is not that we think. This word think is fascinating to me. It means to take account, right? To take inventory or to, this is so good, estimate. He's like, it's not that we think or that we can estimate, and that's what I've been doing a lot of these days in my life, <coughs> estimating the future, estimating what's going to happen, estimating what I'm able to do. Do I have the strength? Do I have what it takes? Will I finish strong? I've been thinking a lot about my ability. And this is what Paul says. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Paul's like, I've come to the understanding. I know this. Without Jesus, I'm nothing. Our qualification comes from God. You see, I'm not qualified to oversee a ministry this large. That's just the truth. I'm not. To lead at prayer networks and pastor networks like Better Together and addiction counseling centers and counseling centers that we're just getting to open our brand new counseling care center. I'm so excited about it in the greater Phoenix area. Um, national school ministries, resource centers, a restaurant, all these things that God's called us to do. The truth of the matter is I don't have the ability in my own natural strength to do all of that. I'm not qualified. Yet God qualified me. And he is the one who has made it happen. Over the last 20 years of my life, he has done exceedingly, abundantly more than I could have ever dreamed or imagined. So when my friend, my friend leaned into me in our counseling session together and said, how did you get where you are, Dan? I knew exactly how I got where I am. And it was not my ability. And that just brought me to this place of great gratitude. Of like, God, you've qualified me. You've been in this all along. I want to take a moment right now and share with you an interview that I saw with some Oklahoma girls softball players. They have won like 53 games in a row. They've won six World Series, College World Series. They're just a dominant team. Um, as a matter of fact, we, we were watching them play. Sydney Sahar, my, my son's girlfriend, is an amazing young lady. She pitches for Azusa Pacific in California, and she's a phenomenal pitcher. She's kind of got us into the whole softball scene these days. And so I watched this interview, and I want to share it with you because here's this team with such great confidence, who's done such amazing things, but watch where their strength comes from. I was so happy to win the college. I've talked about this before, but I was just so happy that we won the College World Series, but I didn't feel joy. I didn't have, I didn't know what to do the next day. I didn't know what to do for that following week. I didn't feel filled and I had to find Christ in that. And I think that is what makes our team so strong is that we're not afraid to lose because if it's not the end of the world, if we do lose, yes, obviously we've worked our butts off to be here and we want to win, but it's not the end of the world because our life is in Christ and that's all that matters. When I saw that interview, I was so blown away at their faith in Jesus. I was so blown away. And, and here's what you need to understand. Insecure people look inward for strength. Confident people look upward. That's something that I've discovered. Here's, here's this team that's so confident, plays so well, but their confidence isn't something that they found inside their inner strength, their own ability. They realize that it isn't their ability. And I love that they were willing to say that to a national audience that God is our strength, and we wouldn't be able to do this without his strength. I absolutely love that. Now, we come to the last part, and I want to encourage you. Take some time this week and really read through and memorize these three verses and own them in your own life as well. This last, this last insight, here we go, this last, last life, life hack, verse 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Paul writes, He has enabled us to be ministers. Actually, this idea of this word here in the Greek language is servants. And here's what we need to understand. We, were, we are on this earth to serve. And here's my focus for the next season of my life. Rather than, do I have what it takes? Am I strong enough? Do I have the ability? Am I going to finish strong? What's going to happen? Here's what I believe. Here's my mantra. God called me to it, and he will empower me to do it. As a citizen of heaven, Jesus has empowered us for a mission. You were born on purpose right now at this point in history. You are not a mistake and you are not here by chance. Mission was the first thing that Jesus told his disciples on the Sea of Galilee. When he called his first disciples, he says, you will be fishers of men. He started right off the boat. He said, here's the deal. You are on mission. You are here to serve. And he goes on. And the last thing he says to the disciples before he ascends to heaven, he says this to them, and you will be my witnesses. 
It's all about mission. And one of the greatest ways to overcome insecurity is to live securely in the mission that God has called us to. You will be confident that you are here on purpose when you live as a citizen of heaven in the mission that God has called you to. That your life matters, that you're here on purpose, that what you do has meaning. Our church mission is simply this. Together, unity, together, the family of God, we are becoming like Jesus for the sake of others. It's always about other people. It's always about being generous and giving your life away. And one of the greatest ways to overcome this selfishness is to give your life away. And I told you already, you'll be confident that you're here on purpose when you start living out your mission in life. He's enabled you to be his minister, to make a difference in this hurting and broken world. Living as a citizen of heaven, that your life matters, matters. There's a lot of great churches out there that are strong in the area of Bible study. And understand this, we want to anchor everything we do in God's Word. Our life crews, everything we do with our heart crews is about being anchored in God's Word. Our messages, we want to anchor in God's Word. The Bible matters. But if the only reason you attend a church is to grow personally, then first of all, that church is not on mission, and neither are you. Because life is bigger than just our own personal growth. Together we're becoming like Jesus. That matters for the sake of others. We're not living as citizens of heaven if we're not giving our life away to other people. You see, we're God's plan A to reach this broken world. And there is no plan B. We're it. You're it. You're God's ambassador. You're here for a reason. You matter. The healing of our nation, those of you who are listening around the world, the healing of your nation, of your town, of your city, hinges on your willingness as a citizen of heaven to live on mission, to share the love of Jesus, to live a generous life, to make a difference and be a servant missionary minister everywhere that you go. But here's the problem with insecurity. You have to understand this. Insecure people think only of themselves. I want to show you something that I've never caught before. It's in a story that most of you, if you know the Bible, you've read through the Bible at all, you've heard this story before. It's a powerful story. But I just want to take a moment and kind of divert a little bit from the section of Scripture we've been in. And I want to tell you a quick story because I had never caught this before. In Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 3, verses 7 through 8, he records a part of the beginning of Jesus' ministry that he puts, he records something here that I was like, when I saw it, Recently, in my devotional time on my break, I was like, I'd never caught that before. So go with me for a moment. Imagine for a moment there's these, this huge crowd of people coming towards the Jordan River. So if, you want to close, if you're able to close your eyes right now, I want you to imagine this, this river that's flowing through maybe an arid region. And, and this huge crowd of people is gathering. And a man comes out of the wilderness. He's dressed in camel's hair. He, he's got some, some locusts feet sticking out of his teeth and his breath smells a little bit mixed with bugs and honey, if you will. His name is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus. He came to prepare people's hearts for the coming of the Messiah. And John begins to preach. And he st- Luke records, he says, when the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, you brood of snakes. I mean, it's not a way to win friends and influence people. Who warned you to flee God's coming wrath? And then John says this, Prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and have turned to God. John's like, listen, you need to repent and you need to prove that you've repented. Now I want you to imagine this huge crowd is there. And all of a sudden, as everybody's standing there listening to John's word and there's silence among the crowds and he stops speaking and all of a sudden you hear one voice say, what should we do? Then someone else goes, yeah, what should we do? And it turns into this anthem of, What should we do? We're cut to the heart. Maybe some people are crying. Can you hear them? Some people are broken and they're repenting and some people are sorry for the sin of their life. And what do we do? How do we, from childhood, they had heard about the coming of the Messiah. And here comes John out of the wilderness, this prophet who's preached like they never heard anybody preach in their lifetime. And he's cut them to the heart and God is moving on them. And they're like, how do we prove it? What do we do? And John's response is epic. Verse 11. And John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. 
If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. He goes on, he says, if you're a tax collector, stop robbing people. If you're a soldier, those of you back there in the back on the horses, stop extorting the people and be content with your wages. John's like, how, how do you prepare to follow Jesus? Stop thinking only of yourself. Get out of your own world and into the world of others. Understand this today. Listen to me. You can't follow the most generous person ever without being generous. Jesus came to give everything, his whole life to us that we might have life. You can't get your heart ready to follow a generous Savior like that until you're willing to be generous yourself. You see, when we fixate on our stuff, our stuff will suffocate us. My wife, Nicole, man, she gets this. Um, there isn't a day of our life together in the last week. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary next week. There's not a day in our life together that I don't find myself listening to my amazing Italian wife talk about her desire to help somebody. She just gets it. She's incredibly generous. I don't know how she takes care of Olivia every day. I, I spent one month in her world, serving every day with her, raising Olivia, and I had to get back to work to rest. I'm just gonna be honest with you. And this last week, we were standing in the kitchen and my wife looked at me and she said, I just feel like there's more that I should be doing. And then she started talking about maybe connecting with pastor's wives on our team, or maybe connecting with some of the pastor's wives with Better Together. She says, I just feel like God is calling me to do more to help these women who are, who are struggling. Maybe some of the younger moms who are struggling with raising their kids. And I'm thinking, you're in your 50s raising a baby. How do you have the energy to do anything else? She just understands generosity. She understands living her life not just for, now, now we should rest. We need to be filled up. There's such thing as compassion fatigue. Don't get me wrong, but as we fill up, we need to pour out. And if you're just coming to church to fill up, you're not on mission. And insecure people are constantly focused on themselves. I know, because when I get in that place, all I'm thinking about is me. How's this gonna affect me? What am I gonna do? Am I gonna be good enough? Am I gonna be strong enough? No, no, no. God brought me to where I am today, and he will bring me where he's taking me tomorrow. That's the truth. So, let me get a little crazy with you for a minute right now. Think about your neighborhood for a second. Of the 10 houses closest to you, how many of those people do you know by name? Do you have any of their phone numbers? Do they have your phone number? Have you shared your Jesus story with anyone in your neighborhood? Have you invited any of them to church or to listen with you online? Would they call you if they were hurting? Our neighbor, Lewis, and his wife, Imi, are going through a very difficult season physically. And one of the great blessings of my life was a few weeks ago, I got a text from Lewis late at night asking me to pray for him and his wife. It was a holy moment. It was a beautiful moment. But the conviction for me was Bruce and Sonia, Lewis and Imi, of the 10 houses closest to me in three years, Oh, they're the only ones that I'm connected with. So I, I'm in this with you. I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm talking to you today. So let me ask you a question that convicted me to the core this week. You ready? If God answered every one of your prayers this week, how many new citizens of heaven would there be? Just think about it. If God answered every one of your prayers this week, how many new citizens of heaven? How many people would have committed their lives to Jesus? Because here's the question. Who are you praying for in your neighborhood? Who are the people in your life you're praying for to come to know Christ? Or is life become all about me and my needs? And God help me with what I'm going through. Nothing wrong with that. But if that's all our prayer life is about is me and not others, we're not living as citizens of heaven on mission with a great God. We're just not. And so, Recently, uh, our church, we have this uh, passion to pray for people to receive Jesus. And so every big, big holiday like Easter or Christmas, we pass out these red cards to everybody on our campuses. 
And online, I think we asked you as well, hey, do you want to send it digitally some names of people to be praying for? And many of you did that. And so we do this every year. And so we gather all these cards, and there's thousands of names of people who are far from God, who need healing, who need God's love, who need to meet Jesus. And it's just an honor as a staff. We get together on Wednesdays to worship as a, as a team. And so they pass out all these red cards. And so they pass out all the red cards, and I get my first red card, and I flip it over, and the name on the card is Olivia's biological mom. Did, can you imagine for a second the thousands of people, thousands and thousands and thousands of names, 60 of our staff members sitting in a room praying and worshiping together, and the one card that I get is from someone in our family because we're kinship guardians. I'm pretty sure I know who did it. It's probably her brother Vince wrote her name on a card, and I got it. And you know what was so beautiful about that moment? Is the gentle conviction that God brought into my life. You've been, you've been praying so much for yourself and how you can have the ability to raise Olivia. Are you praying for her mom to be healed, to be set free from drugs? Are you just consumed with, do I have the strength? Do I have the ability? Can I get through this? The insecurity, will Olivia look at me when I'm 70 years old at her graduation and go, there's my grandpa, or is she gonna say that's my dad? See, that's all about me. And the Holy Spirit in that moment was reminding me, get outside yourself, Dan. Think of others, pray for others, give your life and your time and your attention away to just your, from just yourself. I've come back from my break more fired up than ever to be on mission with you, Pure Heart family. I love being on mission with you. And I know, I know some, some of you are saying, man, it seems like it's all about performance and I gotta be good and do good and if I love enough people, God will love me. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. God is a God of grace and mercy. Understand this. Don't set out to do something great for God. Don't listen to this message, finish up and go, you know what? Today I'm gonna do something great for God. Instead, trust the God who's done something great for you. Start there. When this, this message is over, stop and just thank him for the great work that he did for you on the cross that you did not deserve. And I promise you, if you start with the great things that God has done for you and thank him for it, your heart full of gratitude will overflow into loving other people, to trusting him more. That's just the way it works. Instead of committing today to not be insecure, today I'm not gonna be insecure. Today I'm gonna be confident. I'm gonna go into my job. I'm gonna be confident. I'm gonna go into, this, into my life and be confident. I'm just gonna be confident. Go to my fa- this next family gathering and I'm gonna be confident, all right? No, let's commit ourselves to trusting him who loves us and who will enable us to fulfill his mission in our life. That's where we're gonna start. So we're just gonna push pause right here. We're gonna come back next week and we're gonna build on this message. Spend some time this week in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, reading through verses 4, 5, and 6. Own it for yourself this week. Now, before we end, we always give an opportunity to make the best, biggest, grandest decision of your life, to say yes to the love of Jesus. So if you're out there today watching this message with us, and you've never committed your life to Jesus, or today, you need a recommitment to him. You've been listening to this message, you realize how much he loves you, you've been reminded of his love for you, you wanna live on that mission with him, you want your life to matter, you wanna give him your insecurities and your, fear, your fears and your imposter syndrome, then come to him today. Trust him today with your whole life. Pray this with me right now, if you're in a place today to receive him and you need him, pray this with me right now. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Jesus, forgive me of my sin, You know what it is. Thank you for your forgiveness. Jesus, fill me with your power. Enable me to live out the mission you've called me to in this life. Jesus, today I commit my life to follow you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Greatest decision of your life. And we would love to walk with you and get to know you. Let us know you made that decision today. Love you guys. Have a strong week. We'll see you next week. As Dan was sharing, it made me think, I don't, remember a lot of times, or ever maybe, that I'd heard generosity associated with insecurity, that it's about getting outside of myself. It's about moving past me and my own needs, moving past what I want and my focus, instead of focus on others. I've heard before, hey, get your focus off yourself, you know, it's not about you, but really to boil it down to say, that's based in generosity, which is based on what God wants us to be with others. 
And one of the things that we really try and value here as Pure Heart, as you heard Dan share, is that we want to be a generous church. So check out an opportunity we had to pour into, love, care for, and be generous with some kids in our community. Hey, Pure Heart family, I'm here at a bowling alley uh, with my good friend, Philip, who actually runs, he's the manager of the bowling alley here. Remember, we're hosting our back to school event for 75 kids from the Department of Child Safety. And uh, Philip has been so gracious to allow us to come in here and just have a blast with these kids. Hi everyone, um, as stated, my name is Philip. I'm the general manager at Bolero Glendale. Um, I just wanna say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for everything that you guys have done. Um, as somebody who came from the foster care system, um, it's events like these that really make a difference in a kid's life and you guys are changing lives. So I just want to take a minute and affirm Philip's last statement that he made here, our family. You really are changing lives. 39 of you volunteered to make sure that these 57 kids and adults from kinship connected families through the Department of Child Safety are seen, loved, and absolutely not forgotten. Thank you also to the 229 Pure Art families who gave generously to fill over 400 back to school totes and backpacks that were given to these kids, all of them filled with shoes, socks, underwear, and school supplies. Thank you so much, Pure Art family. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your incredible generosity into our lives that enables us to continue to give to great moments and opportunities like this. We thank you, God, that we get to express heaven's love and kindness and presence through our giving and generosity to individuals and families, especially those through the Department of Child Safety. We pray, God, you'd continue to bless our lives that we may be able to give even more in the days ahead. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. I think each and every one of us knows what it feels like to have been overlooked or forgotten in some moment of our lives. And what I love is that here there's these grandparents taking care of grandchildren and, and children in challenging situations too where you know, maybe their parents are on drugs or they've lost their parents or we don't know the exact circumstances, but both of them probably have had challenges to feel overlooked and forgotten. And we got the opportunity with all these volunteers to show them Christ's love. It's about being generous, about pouring out of our life. Those volunteers that joined us on that, they took time out of their Sunday to go spend time with these kids to let them know you're seen and you're cared for. And that's what I love. Also today, if you accepted Christ when Dan walked you through that prayer at the end. This is an important step, an important journey you're beginning. We would love to walk with you on it. Head on over to pureheart.org slash hand raise so that we can walk with you and give you some next steps. And if you're looking to give into the mission of Pure Heart, if you go, hey, I believe in what Pure Heart's doing. I think that's something I wanna support and be generous with. Then go ahead and head over to pureheart.org slash give. And lastly, we, See a lot of times on YouTube and Facebook and stuff, people say subscribe and like and share. And here's the thing, I don't want you to like this video. I don't want you to share this video unless you were blessed today. And if you were blessed and touched and you felt like your life was impacted or made better by this, then I would encourage you to do that. Go ahead, like, share. Maybe it's the neighbor not next door like Dan talked about, but one of your neighbors on the net right, that we can share with, get to know, and impact with the love of Christ. So we're so glad you all joined us this week, and we'll see you next week. Well, hey, thanks for joining us with Pure Heart Online, a place where we say it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to pretend, and it's not okay to stay stuck. If you recently just began tuning in, we would love to connect with you and find out more about you. Go to pureheart.org slash connect card and fill out a connect form. You can always watch last week's message by clicking the link below.